us of Jesus. We're obviously we're going to be uh, celebrating communion, a time of remembering uh, today. And so the songs, the service is, uh, is geared that way to turn our hearts again and our minds uh, towards that. Why don't you stand with me while we sing number 285, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. would please stay standing while we turn to God's word for the reading. Okay, Psalm 92, verses 1 through 6. Praise to the Lord for his love and faithfulness. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound, for you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the work of your hands. O oh Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a foolish or a fool understand this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do remember what it cost you for us, Lord. And we are so, so thankful for your love, for your faithfulness to us, for the grace that abounds towards us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to pay the price for our sins. Lord, you demonstrated your love towards us, Lord. And Lord, it is our reasonable service, Lord, that we should love you and that we should obey you, Lord. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would just bless this church, bless this body of believers, Lord. Be with those, Lord, who can't be here because of medical issues or because they're traveling, Lord. Lord, you know the needs that we have in our midst. You know the hearts, Lord. All of us have needs, Lord, and your grace is sufficient for all those needs, and we're thankful for that. Lord, just Give us a calmness. Give us a peace today, Lord. Open our minds and our hearts to the preaching of your word. And then when we partake of communion, Lord, help us to really focus on you and to remember what you did for us. And Lord, we are just so thankful. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing on this service, on the song service, Lord, on the, um, the uh, preaching of your word, on the communion. 
And we just pray all of this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to turn now to the uh, song of the month, There Is a Hope. Uh, there are some songs that are, are difficult to, to really engage your mind into and not be affected by because of the truth that is held within the lyrics, uh, because it reflects God's word, because it reflects the human experience with God's word and the way it puts it together. The, this song is one of those. And uh, something I want to challenge you with tonight, with a cop, or you know, as you go home today and tonight, since we don't have an evening service, take some time to sit and to look at that handout um, that has the song, the, the words, and the music there. But on the back, you'll notice that it has the full passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And to read through that passage and how it corresponds to what we are singing about and what we are learning about in this song as it teaches us um, uh, the scriptures and the principles that we find there about what is true about God, what is true about me, uh, and, and who God is to us. And so anyway, we're going to, uh, this was introduced by a couple of the young ladies last week. Um, and we're going to learn this song together. This month, There Is a Hope. There is a hope that burns within my heart That gives me strength for every passing day A glimpse of glory if you come forward for the offering. Uh, one comment on the congregational meeting coming up. We will have uh, budgets uh, available at the congregational meeting so that you can see them and then you'll be able to vote on them two weeks later. Um, so um, we'll be breaking up into two parts. I don't think either one will be very long meetings, um, but it is necessary to break them up. Uh, we will have one song and then uh, Enrique will be able to preach for us and then we'll go right into our congregational meeting. That's this coming, not tonight but next Sunday next Sunday night let's pray together father we thank you just for the privilege of being here together today to worship you we thank you that Christ is our hope and we often place our expectations in in circumstances or in areas of life or in people that um, we then experience unrealized expectations expectations 
But the confident expectation that your word tells us about is that Christ is our hope. That no matter what else is going to happen, whatever comes in our lives, we look forward to the coming of Christ, the hope of the believer. We look forward to the day where we will be with Christ, where sin will be gone, the 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 Corruption from the fall will be, away, will be gone away, and we will be in fellowship, in perfect fellowship with you. And we look forward to that day. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live in light of the coming of Christ every day, in light of the hope uh, of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we live every day that way. I pray, Lord, that today would be a day as we worship you, that we would reflect upon the sacrifice that Christ made for us and breaking his body, going to the cross, suffering and dying and shedding his blood, which is the new covenant and inaugurating a a, a new way, to a clear way to have open access to you. That is afforded through Christ alone. And we thank you, dear Father, for that. And we reflect on that today in our service. And we pray, Lord, that if there is anybody here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, they have not actually appropriated that that death, that shed blood on the cross for their their own sins personally. Today they would understand uh, their own sin, their need of a Savior, and they would come to Christ. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.
sometimes after an offertory, you just sort of want to sit and think about it for a while. But um, we're going to, along the same lines, we're going to sing now together number 276, Jesus Paid It All. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and at this point, when we start to sing, the children can head down through the center doors, down to Junior Church. Number 276, Jesus Paid It All. watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy It is an intriguing thought as we sang that third verse, that I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. As every mother will know, that blood stains, and you need something hefty like Tide or something to clean that out. But when it comes to our sin, it is the blood of Christ that washes us white as snow. Why don't you take a seat? We'll sing one more song together. His Robes for Mine, number 279, a song about the switch that was made between Christ and myself as he paid for my sin. His robes for mine, a oh, wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered beneath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. Bought by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand, with righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord. 
your mind, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. God, God's wrath on sin and right is done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I Forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved. singing this morning. Thank you. Sorry. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, we are in between series right now, and as those of you who have been here for years now know that as we're usually, when I'm in between series, I'll usually preach a couple of messages about uh, usually something... Um, about a particular subject that I think uh, is, would be helpful for us, and today is a subject that I'd like to, I'd like to preach on in 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 11, on the Lord's Supper itself and the significance of the Lord's Supper. We'll probably be, um, we will return to Acts eventually. I think I might uh, preach through the book of Philippians first before returning to Acts. Uh, that might be next. I'm still not 100%, but I think that's probably what's going to happen. And then after that, we'll return to Acts. But today, I wanted, to, um, I wanted to look at a subject that really is not very frequently preached on or taught on in some churches. And yet, it is something that God has commanded us to do on a frequent basis as a church. And it's one of only two ordinances that God gave in, his, in, the, in the Word of God in the New Testament that Christ gave us before he ascended. One being baptism, and the other one that is on a repeated basis that we are to be doing is the Lord's Supper. And I want to begin by just explaining sort of an illustration from my own childhood about what I had perceived in my own life about what the Lord's Supper was all about, and then we'll, that will set us up well, I think, for looking into this text. Uh, how many of you? I'm just. How many of you grew up in a in a Bible preaching church. How many of you had, did, would say, yeah, that was me? Okay, all right. Um, I would say there's a majority here, not everyone, probably maybe a little, maybe 60% if I guessed, right, as long as all of you are raising your hands that should be. <laughs> but um, uh, I remember four things, and this really is not a reflection on necessarily on the, tur- the church I grew up in, and they were, they, it was a very good teaching church. Um, I grew up in a church with expository preaching, and, um, and it was a solid church. Uh, we, would pr- we would practice the Lord's Supper on, once a month. I was saved and baptized fairly early, um, I, and, um, and I really did come to the Lord at an early age. It wasn't just something that was a, a trite profession. I really, the Lord did get a hold of my heart at a very early age, and I came to him um, fairly early. I think I was baptized at like age seven or eight. I think it was seven. And... Um, and then I was, after that, uh, able to take the Lord's Supper. And there are four things that, that in my perception as a child growing up in a good church and partaking of the Lord's Supper, there are four things that I could tell you that I thought the Lord's Supper was about. Number one, 
um, I knew it had to do with the death of Christ. So I, I knew that. Uh, I knew that, it, that you needed to make sure that all your sins were confessed up. That I, you're supposed to make sure all your con- sins were confessed. I knew that if you didn't make sure all your sins were confessed, that you could get sick or die. In fact, I was greatly concerned about this. I was a fairly serious child. Uh, I, was, I, I don't really know if I under, had any sen- kind of sense of humor at all until I was probably uh, 10 or 11. I was, I was. I was just a very serious kid. And, um, and I was greatly concerned about this. I would partake of the Lord's Supper as a Christian young person, and on Monday I'd start getting a sore throat and wonder if I was going to die. Uh, because maybe there was a conf- sin that I didn't confess. Maybe there was a sin that I missed. And man, I hope I'm not getting the sore throat because of that. It, I, I would have, have you like, boy, you had problems. Uh, it might be true. But anyway, uh, I would be concerned about those kinds of things. The other fourth one was that, that I knew about communion was that it made a long service even longer. <laughs> so those were, the, those were the four things that I perceive from my childhood th- about communion. That's what I understood about it. And it wasn't really until seminary that I be- began to really study this out on what, why are we doing this? What is the Lord's Supper? What is it for? Why are we doing it? What's the significance of it? I can tell you that there have been many people that have come to me, Christians, who have been saved for many years, that have admitted to me, you know, I really don't understand the real significance of this. I, 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 don't, I think I'm missing something. And perhaps today you would feel the same way, that, you know, I mean, we're commanded to do it, but it ought not be something where it's just, just a, a ritual that we go through because we're commanded to do it. And sometimes I think that's a possibility, that it's just an empty ritual. Sometimes I think uh, the problem is a, a matter of a reverence. Uh, that, that could be a problem in some churches. It's not usually, we've not, I don't think we've had a problem with that here. But there is a possibility of, of handling it in a way that's irreverent. And that's a wrong manner to handle it in. On the other hand, you can be so sober and somber that you actually don't realize that this is a celebration, that it's, we are actually celebrating the Lord's death and what he did on the cross for us. And so on one hand, you could be irreverent, or on one hand, you could be reverent and not celebratory. On the other hand, you could be celebratory and not irreverent. I mean, the, we need to learn how to handle and, and, and have the Lord's Supper, partake of the Lord's Supper in a way that pleases him. And another quite significant possibility is the danger of a misdirected focus. And we're going to look at this a little bit later, a little bit more, but sometimes we actually partake of the Lord's Supper and we sort of view it as sort of this monthly Baptist confessional. And I'd like to, like to submit to you that that's not at all what God intended for the Lord's Supper, and we're going to see more about that as well. I was reading in my devotions a few weeks, or a few days ago rather, I'm in Isaiah right now, and I was reading in Isaiah 58, and in that passage, um, God is dealing with, through the prophet Isaiah, is dealing with the nation of Israel about the possibility of empty ritual, particularly the ritual of fasting, in Isaiah 58.1. And it says this, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you, have not, you, you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast you have find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. And then in verse 5 it says, Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call his, this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? And in this passage, what it's talking about there is the fact that there was this empty ritual, this, and they were very faithful in doing it, and even, a, even would get into a place of affliction in their own souls about this, and yet they were not really worshiping God in the way that they 
and that God wanted them to worship. And I think we need to understand that the whole idea of the Lord's Supper is inseparably linked to worship. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we find that there are four different components to worship that the first century church did. One of them was the breaking of bread, the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer, to get those four things. And so when we think of the Lord's Supper, it is, it is a component of our worship. And if we are worshiping in a way that is trite, or a ritual, or really not having the kind of meaning or purpose that we ought to have, then I'll tell you, uh, we, we are not really handling the Lord's Supper and worshiping with the Lord's Supper the way that God would have us to worship with it. I am just, this is not in my notes, but I, I can tell you that the, the, the songs that were chosen today as I was just reading these lyrics and listening and singing, uh, what rich lyrics about the cross. I, was, I tell you, I, I felt like I was just listening to a message preached after going through all of those different songs about the cross. And I could have walked away, frankly, uh, very blessed by all of that. Uh, is that the... Did, did, we, we need, when, we're, when we are worshiping, we ought to be focused really on the meaning of what, we're, of, of what is being sung, what we're singing, what is being played, all of that is part of our worship. The church at Corinth, among many other problems, was having a problem with, their, with, with partaking of the Lord's Supper together as an aspect of their worship. And with that in mind, I'd like to pick up here in verses, and, and we'll read verses 17 through 22 together. And, um, and then we'll pray together. We're going, to read, we're going to actually go through the whole passage, but we'll just do 17 through 22 uh, to begin. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized by you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, but in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and, and, and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. And I'll go ahead and read the next few verses here, which we're going to see again. But For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you this morning, I pray that you would help us as we, as we work through a passage that is intended to instruct us about this matter of worshiping you through the Lord's Supper. And Father, I pray that you would help us um, to really learn how uh, to, to practice this in a meaningful manner. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see afresh and anew the significance of this, and that our church, when we come together for the Lord's Supper, would be, it would really be a meaningful, purposeful time where we can experience um, in remembrance the death of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand all of this today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we pick up in verses 17 through 22 where the Apostle Paul is dealing with the church of Corinth about a particular problem. Really to understand the problem that he is dealing with, we need to understand some background about the Roman culture, particularly about the way that larger houses were set up. As you probably know, uh, that in the first century, churches met in houses. Houses. 
And it was of the wealthier people that had the larger houses that were Christians uh, that would open up their homes to allow an assembly to meet together uh, to worship on the Lord's Day and really many times on a daily basis. Uh, And we find in Scripture in the book of Acts that actually the Lord's Supper was practiced in the first century daily. Certainly on on the first day of the week it was practiced as well. And, it, was, and it, it, was, it, it happened as people gathered and assembled together in these houses. And a house, um, a, a typical Roman-style house, um, a Roman villa, if you will, of the day, had two major rooms for hospitality. The one room that it would have was called a triclinium. And a triclinium was a room that was usually around 24, to eight, 24 by 18 feet in, in, uh, in, in space. Um, so it's a reasonably sizable room. There was a table in the center of the room, and as you probably know, even from pictures from the Lord's Supper, from the first Lord's Supper, uh, there would be recline, there would be a, they would recline as they eat. So there would be these, sort of these couches that would, that would spoke out from the, from the center table. And so realistically, you really, because of the large couches that were in this triclinium, you probably could only seat maybe nine or ten people at the most, in this, in this room. But there would be another room in the house as well, and that room would be uh, a, a bit smaller, 20 by 16 feet usually, somewhere around there. And, uh, but it would fit more people because you didn't have these reclining couches. Uh, in fact, it would fit pop, you know, 30 or 40 people or, or perhaps even more. And... And the people that were, it was called the atrium, actually. And, and those folks were usually considered to be the, the second-class citizens, the servants, uh, the people that um, were not really the honor guests, maybe the latecomers, the ones that were less well-connected, those kinds of Christians, uh, those kinds of people. And that was in the Roman way of doing things, the Roman dining convention. Now, this became a bit of a problem when it came to everyone, the Christians, assembling together for the Lord's Supper. They would have these love feasts, and what began to happen is the wealthier Christians would invite their friends, the people that they felt were most important, it was their house that, were, that, was, they, were being, that were, they were owning, and they would give them the best seats uh, in this triclinium, and then all the people that came later uh, or, or were not as special guests would be in the other place, uh, the, the atrium, and there would, become a, there would be a sort of a, a, a divide between these two kinds of people. And in fact, what, you've, what began to happen is in the triclinium, you'd have all kinds of, of, uh, of drink and food and all kinds of things, and the people in the atrium were actually expected to bring their own food uh, with them. And they would... With that, in that kind of cultural context, they would then try to practice the Lord's Supper. Now, if you understand the context and all of that, then we can look at verse 17, and we will pick up here and we'll begin to see what Paul is dealing with. Verse 17 says, Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. The very first thing that Paul says is, you are actually assembling together, and it is actually, you are doing more harm than good. This is not for the better, this is actually for the worse. It's doing, in fact, the exact opposite of what, it, in, you, what the assembling together should be doing. Now what we find in the book of Ephesians, as well as in the, in the, in, in the book of James, and really all over the New Testament, is that the assembling together should always promote unity there ought to be a unity in the body of christ and when you assemble together it is a a reflection of that unity that you have in the body but that was not happening in the church at corinth and there were divisions that were reported to paul verse 18 for first of all when you come together as a church i hear that there are divisions among you and in part i believe it For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. 
Of course, the one adult Sunday school class that we have been going, uh, that, that have, has been teaching through the book of, Cor uh, of Corinthians, and they, I'm sure, noted in that class that the, there are many divisions in the church of Corinth. Divisions over giftedness. Divisions over wealth. Divisions over who, who discipled who and who was of who. This was dealt with in the very first chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, where it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, by brethr my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of, of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. The Apostle Paul later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 cites that the pro problem they were having is that these people were carnal, they were fleshly, they were not spiritual, and so there were divisions among them. Now this is exactly the opposite of what should be happening. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Clearly, in that verse, we have a unity, not a division, that God desires to have in His church. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says that we ought to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And there were many things in the first century church that, that threatened the unity of the body. And really, frankly, it, these kinds of things continue to threaten the unity of any body of believers. One of the major problems that, that, this is, that is contributing uh, to, the, to the issue here was that there, there was favor given to those who were wealthy. And there was the wealthy Christians were beginning to take advantage of the those who were not wealthy. In fact, that is the central problem in chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 of 1 Corinthians, where the wealthy are actually taking the, the less wealthy to court because they can afford to do so. And God says, you ought not be doing that. You ought to deal with those kinds of things within the household of God. That a prob Again, the problem was a problem of division in the body of Christ. In James chapter 2, verse 1, you have the same problem. It says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord of glory with partiality. For there should come into an assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a, in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay, you pay attention to, the, to one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to your poor man, you stand there or sit there here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Well, we begin to see the problem. He, we know that this is... What they're doing is actually causing more harm than good. But the result of all that they are doing surfaces in verse 22. He says, what? Do you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? That sh that shall, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. He begins to explain that the problem of the coming together that was happening there in that first century is that it, it produced or fostered rather a culture of shame. Where people who, who should have been considered equal in Christ were shamed because they were in some sort of less status because of the, of the issues uh, within how they were handling the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul is going to make this more explicit later, but he essentially alludes to the fact that, look, you've got houses to eat in. Like, eat your food, enjoy your food in your own house before you come together for the Lord's Supper. That the purpose of the Lord's Supper is not to have a meal to satiate your hunger. That's not the purpose of the Lord's Supper. Now, that might be foreign to us, 
Why? Because when you, nobody's going to satiate your hunger by that. And that is actually intentional. We don't want that to, we don't, one of the reasons we do it the way we do it is because we don't want that to be an issue in our church where the Lord's Supper is, is it's, it's a matter of satiating your hunger. Paul is saying, no, you're, you're not seeing the right purpose here. This is not the, the right purpose. And all of what they are doing is causing shame. And it's interesting what it says. It says that it is despising the church of God. The word despise there means to think little of or to be mindless about. That what was really going on here was they were really not considering the importance of the body of Christ, the unity of the body, the importance of the church, which is, which is of power, paramount importance because it is the body of Christ. Now that's important for us to understand. In fact, it's interesting. I had a few weeks, a few maybe a couple of months ago, I actually was somebody who visited our church, and they asked me, "What is the difference between a church and a Bible study?" Do you know how to answer that, by the way? What is the what is the biblical difference between a Bible study that meets weekly and a church? And you know, essentially, the answer to that is a church practices the ordinances, and a Bible study does not. And they said, well, what if a Bible study practices the ordinances? Well, then, frankly, it's just become a church. And so, if you want to be a church, practice the ordinances. If you don't want to be a church, don't practice the ordinances. You're a Bible study. And there are other, there are other considerations as well, formal church membership, church leadership, and other things. But in its most essential, essentially, what makes a church a church are the practice of these ordinances. Because they... Repre they represent the body of Christ. And that's exactly what we are. We are, as a church, the body of Christ. And the poor are being shamed, which is obviously a problem. Now, by way of application, we want to make sure, folks, that in our worship, whether it's in the Lord's Supper or any other part of our worship, that we don't, we don't come together and it become more harm than good. I don't think that's happening. Uh, thankfully, in our church. But we always want to make sure that we, we, we are aware that that could happen, and we want to make sure that we don't allow that to happen. I wrote four ways, just based upon, based upon what we have here, four possibilities that would cause, cause a church to assemble in a way that would actually become more harmful than good. Number one is when our ulterior purpose becomes a primary purpose. The church becomes, for example, a social gathering. But our main reason to come to church is to see our friends. Now, you, I, we've always told our children that that should not be your primary reason for coming to church, that it's certainly enjoyable to see your friends, but your primary reason for coming to church is to worship the Lord and to have fellowship with one another, not, not to see your friends. But you know what? We as adults can fall into that as well. It's not just our kids. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can we can begin to think of church as just simply a social gathering and a secondary purpose, nothing wrong with having friends in church and nothing wrong with seeing friends in church, could become a primary purpose. And if that's the case, then we actually could be coming, come to a place where we're doing more harm than good. Another possibility is, is when ritual replaces meaning and purpose. If we're just coming to get through it or just coming to do our duty or to I just said do our duty. Somebody in here doesn't like that. But anyway, um, or, or, or a ritual. I mean, it really is, um, it really can be a problem. And then, uh, when disunity is fostered rather than dispelled, when, they're, when, when actually coming together causes disunity, which was what was happening here, it was actually dividing people rather than bringing people together. And finally, when we are preoccupied with personal interests that distract, that distract us from pleasing God, those four things can actually end up causing us to, whether it's the Lord's Supper or any other aspect of our worship, <coughs> can really become a problem. Now what Paul does here in the next section, in verses 23 through 26, is he lays out exactly Christ's words in fact and exactly the manner in which and the purposes in which we ought to partake of the lord's supper but to really grasp this to really understand 
<coughs> what is happening here, we need to really go back to a, a earlier practice that precedes the church, and that is the Passover. Remember when the first Lord's Supper occurred, Jesus was in the upper room, and they were celebrating the Passover feast. It's actually important for us to understand what was happening there in order for us to really get the significance of the Lord's Supper. We as Christians do not celebrate the Passover anymore, but there is a sense in which the Lord's Supper is to replace the Passover. In fact, that's definitely true. So what was the Passover for? Well, the Passover was, was intended to be uh, to bring to memory the deliverance of the nation of Israel from captivity in the nation of e from, from, from Egypt, from the bondage of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, it says, So this <coughs> day shall be to your, you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by, the everlasting, by an everlasting ordinance. And so you have here in this passage, it says there's an everlasting ordinance that you're supposed to keep in order for there to be a, a memorial, a remembrance of how, of how uh, God delivered the nation of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. But folks, there is more significance to the Passover than that, than that because the Passover for foreshadowed or foretold of the coming of the, the Messiah, of the one who would really shed his blood and break his body for us. They, as you may know, uh, broke unleavened bread together, and we that has not changed. We are essentially doing the same thing uh, in the Lord's Supper as well, and so there is some confluence between the two. Also of note is what it says in Deuteronomy 26, verse 5. It says, And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian, about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, a few in number. And there he became a nation great, mighty, and populous. And that was an example of when they would actually rehearse exactly Israel's history. As the Passover continued, they would re rehearse together Israel's history <coughs> so that they could remember God's deliverance. But there is even more so, if you'll recall this, there was another, besides the, the element, if you will, of the broken bread, of the unleavened bread that they partook of. You remember there was actually another element. And that is the element of the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs was a reminder to the nation of Israel that they were still in a kind of bondage that there was a bitterness to their life. But that was going to one day be alleviated by the Messiah who would come. And of course, we as the church do not partake of bitter herbs anymore. Why? Because the Messiah has come. And instead of partaking of bitter herbs, we instead partake of what? We partake of the fruit of the vine, uh, commemorating the blood of Christ, which is, we'll see in a minute, is the new covenant, which we'll identify in a few moments as well. <coughs> now, with that in mind, let's look at a couple of things when it comes to the importance and the actual purpose of the Lord's Supper. Paul begins by saying, what I have received, I have received from the Lord. Now, he is saying this because um, he is recalling the fact that Christ set up the Lord's Supper himself in person to the disciples, and they were to carry on this practice as the church began. And Paul is saying, what I have received the Lord, I am now passing to you as a faithful apostle. That is, that it is God's intention that the church always continue to practice the Lord's Supper. That's frankly why we always read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because we are continuing on what Paul said as he continued on from what the Lord said, uh, we are continuing in that vein, as Paul said it, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And you can find those passages in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, you can find uh, when the Lord's Supper was taking place in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 
and Luke 22, they all say basically the same thing. Christ, interestingly enough, did not partake of the fruit of the vine. He partook of the bread, but didn't partake of the fruit of the vine. He said, I'm not going to do that because I am going to the cross. Uh, and so he, he, the, the, the disciples did it in, in looking to the cross, but he chose not to do that. But do you remember <clears throat> after he died and rose from the grave and met with the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Do you remember what happened there? He did partake of both the bread and, and, the, and the juice as well, and the fruit of the vine as well. This has all been handled, handed on from God or from Christ to the apostles, and to his church. And that is appropriate. And so, and so Paul is saying, look, don't, don't, don't allow the Roman culture, which in this case is actually harming the Lord's Supper, to, 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 to do that. Rather, do it the way Christ did it. And there are two, there are two purposes, essentially, in these verses that tell us what we are supposed to be doing when we partake of the Lord's Supper. The first is the remembrance, the word remembrance. You see it twice there. This do in remembrance of me in verse 24. You see the same thing again in verse 25. We are to do this in remembrance. Well, what does it mean that we are to do this in remembrance? <coughs> it says that Jesus, after giving thanks, so... The attitude in which we ought to have as we are doing this is a thankful heart. The remembrance that we are supposed to have is as we, as we reflect on what Christ has done for us, there is a thankful heart. The word, you'll know it, uh, the Greek word for thankfulness, is where we get our word Eucharist from. Now, there are some denominations that, that almost exclusively call this the Eucharist. It isn't actually inaccurate to call it a Eucharist, although this is the only time that the word Eucharist is mentioned. The word communion is mentioned a couple of times, and then you have the word, the Lord's Supper. Now, out of the three, which one do you think is mentioned most in the New Testament? Would it be Eucharist, would it be communion, or would it be the Lord's Supper? Yeah, uh, the Lord's Supper is mentioned more, far more frequently than the other two terms. Now, you can use any of the three terms. Uh, we, tend to, we tend to use communion or the Lord's Supper uh, as, as the two more more um, favored terms and frankly that is appropriate because they are more used more frequently in the new testament but the attitude nevertheless should be that we ought to have a thankful heart the central focus is the breaking of the bread <coughs> what is happening here well christ's body was being broken for us and so it says here, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now, a couple of things that we need to uh, understand here. Um, one is, then it moves to the cup, and it, it says, this is the blood of the new covenant. It uses this word New Testament or new covenant. What, what is it? What it you ever, I mean, we read this every single month. Have you ever wondered what it's saying here, the blood of the new covenant? What does that mean? What's it talking about? Well, now with a little background, we understand, first of all, that the Old Covenant is the Mosaic Covenant is talking about. The Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant, they practiced the Passover. Jesus is now saying that with the New Covenant, the New Covenant in my blood, we're not, you're not practicing the Passover anymore. Instead, you are pra practicing the Lord's Supper. And so you have this, this, this uh, symbol of the blood of Christ that is mentioned here. But let's go ahead and ask the question, what is the New Covenant? Well, if you'll recall, perhaps, from earlier studies, a covenant is, a, is a <coughs> an agreement uh, between two parties, in the, and, and in the Old Testament you have unconditional covenants and you have conditional covenants. The unconditional covenant of note that we all, we all are recipients of is the Abrahamic covenant. In that covenant, you have land promises, which we're not recipients of, but you also have the, pro it says, in thee all the families of the earth will be blessed, and in Israel, all the families are blessed through Christ. And so we are partakers in that sense of the spiritual aspects of the Abrahamic covenant. But you had things like land promises in the, 
in the Abrahamic covenant. And then when you get to the Mosaic covenant, you have, which is a conditional covenant, you have all kinds of conditions on that covenant. And what the new covenant is, is actually found in Jeremiah 31. And you might want to write this down. We're not going to look at it now, uh, just for sake of time. But in Jeremiah 31, you have the new covenant is mentioned. And a couple other places, the book of Ezekiel as well, it's mentioned. And what you have in that passage is you have physical promises, but you also have spiritual promises. The spiritual promises are the same promises that you find in the Abrahamic covenant, and they foretell the coming of Christ and how he is going to shed his blood on the cross for all men. And we are partakers in that way of the new covenant. Now, this gets a little confusing, but let me just say it this way. The new covenant essentially has two parts. The spiritual parts, part and the physical part. The physical part of the new covenant is not yet fulfilled. Where the lion lies down with the lamb, for example where there are other things that occur. That will happen when, folks? During the second coming of, after the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign, that's when the physical aspects of the new covenant will come. But the spiritual aspects of the new covenant, we are recipients of now. And it says in Hebrews chapter 8 this, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete how what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are essentially recognizing that the old Mosaic covenant has vanished. Why? Well, it's not that Christ destroyed it when he came. What did Christ do? He fulfilled it so that we no longer have to fulfill the obligations of the Mosaic covenant. Instead, we fulfill the, the requirements of the new covenant which essentially is unconditional. It's faith alone. That's the only requirement for salvation. It's to trust in Christ alone for salvation. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, it actually says that the blood of Christ ratifies the new covenant. In that verse it says, and for this reason he is the meteor of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant and those who are called <clears throat> may receive the promise of the internal, eternal inheritance. <clears throat> and it's kind of like this. So I'm going to bring up a controversial subject, but I'm not going to comment on, I'll just preface this, I'm not going to comment on what I think about it at all. So right now we have a government shutdown. Why? Well, we have Congress and the President can't agree on things. And I'm not going to say who is right or, I don't, you know, I, whatever. That's not the point of this. Uh, and so we have this government shut down, shut down and, and, in, and, and what needs to happen is a bill needs to be passed through Congress and then needs to come to the ex executive branch of the, of the government and needs to be signed into law. So we have, that all, we have that kind of thing happening all the time in our country. But, and, and you could sort of essentially say that that is essentially a covenant or a law that's now been signed. But sometimes those laws, isn't it true, that those laws are not, do not take effect right away. Sometimes it's well, this one would need to, but, uh, but others may take a year before it actually goes into effect. And there's usually written into these laws some sort of something that actually ratifies it, that starts the thing, that begins the actual execution of that law. The executive branch is there to do that. It's to ex execute the laws of the legislative branch. And so, so all of that to simply say that, this, that while God gave the new covenant to Jeremiah and to the nation of Israel, it's ratified by the blood of Christ. That is, the beginning, the spiritual blessings of the new covenant are established. Why? Because Christ did what? He shed his blood on the cross for us. Now, then we look at this idea of it being a symbol of the... It says, this is my body... And is, and is the blood. Did you notice it says that? Maybe uh, that is why you have some churches that would believe in something called transubstantiation, where they say that this actually becomes the blood and body of Christ, because it says, "This is my bo body. This is my blood." Now, I want to assure you that that's not what it's talking about here. <clears throat> uh, it's it is it essentially, if I said. Um, 
if I said something like, uh, this is, um, uh, this, if maybe I, I took my wedding art ring off, I said, this is my marriage. It'd be a kind of an interesting way to say it, but, but it's not my marriage, but it is. It's representing, it's symbolically representing my marriage. Um, and essentially, that's what's happening here. It is a symbol. But I, let, me, let, me, let me hasten to say this. Although it is a symbol, it is a special kind of symbol. Sometimes I think we want to shy so far away from transubstantiation and consubstantiation that we don't realize how special a symbol this really is. And we miss God's actual intended purpose for this symbol. And I want to just illustrate it this way. Um, in my office, both in my home office and in, in my office at church, I have pictures of different members of my family. Uh, in my home office, I have uh, pictures of my, of my wife, uh, or me and my wife together, those kinds of things. And every once in a while, you know, I'll just sort of look over at you know, my, my, our wedding picture or whatever, that kind of thing, just kind of reflect on, boy, it's been you know, almost 15 years now, and just kind of reflecting on it with fond memories of things and but but usually it's just sort of a glance and I sort of see it and then I you know it's not really much more than that but if you sit down if I if I sit down and there is a scrapbook that my you know back when you made scrapbooks does anybody make scrapbooks anymore with all the electronic digital stuff not too much probably but back when you made scrapbooks my wife made a scrapbook of when we were first dating in fact we were on our first dating outing and there's this there's actually this picture of my of Elizabeth and me and we are we are totally soaked we're wet we're totally soaked from head to toe we're on the bank of a river and you could see the tip of a canoe and that picture is more than just sort of some standard picture there's a there's like a whole story behind that there's like you know a lot to that it was actually the first time uh, that well I don't know if it was the first time we went on a date she asked me she asked me to that uh, um, and I always said that I would never go on a dating outing with, a, with somebody uh, when, the, when the girl asked the guy. I just didn't like that idea. It's amazing how your principles change when they're really good looking. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so, um, so I, I did, and, um, and it was sort of funny because that was pretty well known. I mean, I had, uh, had other girls ask me on their dating outings, and I always turned them down. And uh, so we went on this canoe trip, and I told my wife, I, my wife, <laughs> I told my not even girlfriend, my friend, um, that, um, you know, uh, she, she had, so if you know Elizabeth, she's always prepared, and she had, like, her camera in a plastic bag. She had an extra thing of clothes in a plastic bag. She had, everything was in Ziploc baggies, and, I mean, she was all prepared for this thing, and I'm like, what is all of that? And she said, well, I, in case we capsize, I said, we're not going to capsize. That's just not gonna. You know, that's not gonna happen. And um, and uh, I said I've been in canoes lots of times. I've never capsized. It's it, it'll it'll be all right. And she goes okay, but she still brought all of that stuff. And um, and we're in a canoe. And so and so I I had been on canoes on a lake, not on a river. Number one and number two, I had no idea how many canoes were going to be out there. There were tons of canoes. This was a very large collegian that she was a part of, and there was a ton of canoes at this in this dating outing, and. Um, <laughs> and um, there were some guys, some friends of mine that saw me on this dating outing, on this girl's dating outing, you know, like where the girl asked the guy, and they thought it was hilarious, and understandably, and they decided that they were going to ram my canoe, and that's exactly what they did. They ran my canoe. We both ended up in the river. My wife had a change of clothes. I did not. My camera got ruined. Her did not. Hers did not. And, um, and that is the story behind this one picture. Now, why do I tell you all that? Well, because I wanted to make sure you're awake. But um, uh, we had a lot of facts in there, and this kind of lightens things up. But the, other, but the other major reason was because, you know, a picture where you're, just, where you're just seeing a person doesn't necessarily allow you to reflect on an entire experience. But, a, but certain pictures would allow you to reflect on an entire experience. And what God intends with the breaking of the bread and with the, with the drinking of the fruit of the vine, what God intends is for us not just to tritely remember what Jesus did, 
but to really, it's almost as though we experienced it. Think of the spiritual that sing, that, 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 the, 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 the lyrics that say, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? In fact, you could almost think of a, a reenactment. Why do people go to reenactments? Like, there's different people that I see on Facebook, they'll go to, they'll go to reenactments out in uh, all kinds of different places. I don't know how people have that much time to go to reenactments. It looks like it takes a while. It takes time to do that, but uh, people do. And I thought to myself, well, why do people go on reenactments? My guess is that you begin by reading books about a particular civil war or civil war battlefield or whatever kind of battlefield, uh, revolutionary war, and, and you're so into that and you begin to really get into it that you want to, you want to get as close as you can to experiencing it. Now, you don't really want to experience it, but you want to get kind of as close as you can and so you go to a reenactment so that you can kind of really, really remember. Well, in kind of, like, sort of like that, God wants us to experience to, to, to really think and remember and contemplate what he did when, he, when Jesus died to pay the punishment for our sin and shed his blood on the cross for us. He wants us almost as though to, it, it's like to sit at the foot of the cross and experience it. To experience what Jesus did, to personalize it, to realize how he did that for you and for me. You see, God understood we needed this ordinance because we have really good forgetters and we also are really good at taking things for granted. Is that not true? I mean, just think of all of the things that you have in your life, all of the blessings that you have, all the things that you don't deserve. We are very good at taking things for granted. And God did not want us to take the death of his son for granted. He wanted us to to really remember and to experience and to, and to really take the time for it to be something meaning, meaningful. Uh, the word remembrance means to be a, a, a kind of a dramatic involvement, an actualization, a reenactment, an experience of what Christ did for us, a time of serious, meaningful, thankful reflection. Then we find the second purpose here is verse 26. Uh, we find it is to proclaim the Lord's death. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, this has gone a little bit longer than I expected, but let me just quickly just summarize verses 27 through 34 for us. Remember I talked before about the... Um, about the the idea that I was really worried about not confessing a sin and getting sick the next day, that kind of a mentality. That's really illustrative of, of the, the problem that we sometimes have when we come to the Lord's Supper of using it or viewing it as some sort of confessional. Do you know what the major problem with, with, with viewing it that way is? Who's the focus on? focuses on me. The real problem with viewing the Lord's Supper as a time to just confess all of my sin is that I am now focused on me, not on Christ. And I would encourage you that that was never God's intention. Now, it does say here that if you partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily, that you are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, and that there is this possibility, that the, there are people that that, that are sick and, and that even die because they are not handling this correctly. But let me begin by just simply saying this. Number one, this warning has to do not with did you confess every sin that you possibly could have confessed and if you miss one, you're going to get sick and die. It's not what it's talking about here. Aren't you relieved? I was relieved when I found that out. I didn't find that out until I was in seminary, honestly. And I, I, began to, I realized I, I had a teach. I had an instructor that basically pointed this out, and I said, boy, man, what a relief. That's not what it's talking about here, folks. Now, if you come to the Lord's Supper, and you know that there is sin in your life, well, folks, just like any other time, you ought to confess that. As soon as you know you have sin in your heart that you've not confessed before the Lord, 
Well, then certainly you ought to confess it before God. Uh, you want to have a clean heart before God, not just at the Lord's Supper, but any time. And so, so I'm not negating the necessity of confessing our sin to the Lord when we, when we understand we're sinning. We need to agree with God about that so we can have a clear fellowship with Him. But on the other hand, the point of, of this is, is, let me put it this way for you grammarians, it's adverbial, not adjectival. It's an adverb, not an adjective. Now the point is simply this. That it's not talking about whether or not you are unworthy. It's talking about whether what you're doing is unworthy. It has to do with the manner in which you are doing it. So if you are doing this in the wrong manner, then you are taking of the body, uh, you're partaking, un, by the way, the King James says it this way, unworthily. You know why it adds the L-Y? It's on purpose. Because it wants to show you it's not unworthy, it's unworthily. It's an adverb there. And it is in the Greek as well. So how is it that we partake, why, how do we run the risk of partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily? How do we do that? Well, the context already told us how they were doing it. They were divisive in the way that they were partaking of the Lord's Supper. They were putting some people above another. They were handling it tritely. But I think it really boils down to this. It says in the passage, not discerning the Lord's body. And what it's talking about there is that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are not really seeing it as something that is special. We're seeing it as just another ritual, or perhaps we're viewing it and doing it in a way that it's just trite, or perhaps even worse, which we don't really do here, it's not even possible hardly, we're doing it to satiate our hunger or some other reason besides actually remembering and pro 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 proclaiming the Lord's death. If you're doing it in that way, <coughs> then you are partaking unworthily. And I'll simply say this as well. It does say that we need to examine ourselves. And we ought to examine ourselves. What does it mean to examine? Our, examine? It's talking about there to determine the genuineness of something. It's like if you are, I remember when I was, when I was I've got all kinds of illustrations about my wife and she's not here today, but, um, she's, uh, but anyway, um, she's watching by, by way of um, streaming. She's probably nervous right now because I'm talking about her again. But remember, I remember when I was looking for a ring with her, for her and I was looking for, I wanted to make sure, I, I, did, I did enough research to realize that you needed to look at the cut and the clarity and all that in the ring to make sure it was a good ring. Well, I would look at the ring and I would scrutinize it the best I could with my amateur way of doing that, to try to make sure that what I was getting was something that was genuine. It wasn't cubic zirconia or something like that. It was actually a genuinely a diamond. I could I not be able to get a very big diamond at the time, but I was going to get something that was real. Folks, that's what it's talking about here. It's talking about a matter of genuineness. When we come to the Lord's Supper, is there a genuineness as we partake of the Lord's Supper? And God says... We ought, to, we ought to examine ourselves, not to make sure that, we, like to figure out every sin that we don't even remember, but simply to say, am I doing what I am doing with a genuine heart toward the Lord? Is there a genuineness about not myself, because folks, we're totally unworthy. Remember that, we're unworthy no matter what, or we are completely worthy because of Christ, either way. But is there a genuineness in the manner in which I am doing it? That's what God wants us to get to. Now, what we're going to do is I had to, I had to do some serious abbreviation there. We're going to stop right here. And um, we're going to take some time then uh, to, to give you just a few moments to do exactly that. And that is to examine our hearts before we partake of the Lord's Supper. And remember what you're examining now. You're examining the genuineness in your own heart about a thankful heart and remembering what the Lord's, Lord has done for you. And we'll just take a few moments to do that now. And then as we, and then we, will, we will begin, we'll sing together, and then uh, we will partake uh, together. Uh, gentlemen, you can come forward when, when, you, when we begin to sing together. That's the best time to come forward. So just a few moments of silence now. <coughs> 
Father, would you uh, bless us as we enter into this communion time. And we do come with a heart of thankfulness and gratefulness. We look at our own lives and we see our own sin. We realize our own worthiness. And it is only by your grace that you have saved us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us today to come to the foot of the cross to recognize what Christ has done for us. To remember with more than just a trite thought, but to really reflect and to remember the great sacrifice that is made that was made for us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.